Welcome to As I Live and Grieve, a podcast that tells the truth about how hard this is. We're glad you joined us today. We know how hard it is to lose someone you love and how well-intentioned friends and family try so hard to comfort us. We created this podcast to provide you with comfort, knowledge, and support. We are grief advocates, not professionals, not licensed therapists. We are you. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to As I Live and Grieve. You hear me say this every week, I know, but I'm really excited about our guests today. Each week, we seem to get better and better, and our guests are just so interesting to talk to. Today, we have with us Addison Brazil. Now, you've heard Stephanie and I talk about where we are. We're in western New York over near Buffalo. It just so happens that Addison is joining us today from Australia, where he is on book tour. So welcome, Addison. Thanks so much for joining us. And as we start out, could you just kind of give our listeners a little bit of your background? Yeah, absolutely. And thank you so much for having me. The future is bright. I am uh, 15 year- hours ahead, according in Australia, as you <laughs> said. Yeah, I guess um, the main thing I always like to say, the shorter version, is that I never really intended to be a men's mental health advocate or show up in the grief space as an author, as I'm sure you guys can resonate. You never really intend to to show up in this st- space so Exactly. But over the course of my 20s, while um, pursuing a career in film and television um, and events in Los Angeles, I um, I came up up against um, dealing with death and grief quite a lot. Um, I lost my brother to brain cancer. um, And then four years after that, I found my father after his suicide, Mm -hmm. uh, which opened up an entire world of a journey of both just mental health becoming such a priority and really grappling with compounded grief, now losing both my brother and my father before being 25 right. years old. And uh, so I set out into the world alongside still working, trying to really fix that grief, trying to find any way to quiet it, to get rid of it, to just not have it be a part of my life, because it was in many ways debilitating when it showed up. And I think that I kind of thought I had done that, um, so much so that I was beginning to celebrate, feeling like I had made some sort of comeback and fixed my grief. And I went out to celebrate with a, with a friend in Los Angeles. And uh, on the way home, we got into a very tragic accident uh, that killed my dear friend and left me relearning to walk, <sighs> hospitalized with a brain injury, and truly just having to make sense of the world. So I found myself in yet again another grief process but also a very personal grief process of my life was now for sure never going to be the way I thought it was going to be. And it certainly wasn't going to return to the way it once was. Adding in that element of physical pain when being physical had been such a big part of my mental health mixtape and my my journey really brought me Mm -hmm. to the scariest moments of my life. I mean, I did enter a suicidal depression and it was sort of everybody on hand and on board and everyone had to come together and, and I had to really really surrender and, and figure out my way forward. And, and it was sort of at that moment of, I just kind of looked back up to the powers that are above. And I said, you know, if you get me through this, I'll go back for the others. Uh, and I remember just really, really meaning that because I was just so scared for where I was mentally and what I was going through. And with a lot of hard work, amazing coaches, uh, a lot of physical therapy, I did get to a point where um, I'm 95% pain free, which is a miracle, according to what I was being told by surgeons. A little bit mm-hmm. earlier than mm-hmm. wow. And what's becoming the more wild part of my story is that I'm able to show up fully again and experience love and awe and hope and a lot of gratitude and, and, um, and move forward in this way that I call honoring my grief journey, um, not trying to fix it anymore. And and out of that was born my book, which you know about, First Year of Grief Club, A Gift for Who mm-hmm. Gets It. And what that's really become is over the years, anytime, even though I was sort of the grief guy, the death guy, anytime anybody would ask me what to do for someone or, or share with me that they were experiencing a loss, um, whether it be death or just something extremely meaningful, anytime that would happen, I would sort of freeze. And I don't know if this resonates with you guys, but it's sort of like, I don't want to it know is. how bad it is. I don't want to be the guy. And I certainly don't want to just send over some flowers that will also die or like, a, you know, a casserole in the mix or be overbearing or too mm-hmm. unsupportive. So I, you know, I knew it so intimately that I would really struggle. And then we found ourselves in this pandemic possible time 
where, you know, the rights of passage and the ability to gather was now threatened. So people really weren't being supported. So I thought, mm-hmm. well, how could I, without always being on the phone or on messaging, really befriend someone for a year after loss? How could I really be there with them and come from it at a point of view as someone else in the grief arena, not, you know, someone who's studying it from above, but someone who's just in that gym every day across the hall. And maybe I've been there a few mm-hmm. months longer and you want to come over and ask like, oh, I noticed, you know, your, your, your arms are looking great. What do you do for that? You know, that kind of very right. <laughs> level. And I, and I, that carried through all of my advocacy work, whether it was working with other brain tumor families in memory of my brother or the men's mental health movement that I got very involved in. It, that's always been sort of my dream is to stretch what a peer can do and stretch how much an everyday person can know and kind of get as close as possible to feeling resilient within what we know is just, you know, a very, very hard journey sometimes forward. Yeah. The only thing I feel like we need to say right now is, um, wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, that's, uh, and yeah. I, I hate to ask the age question, but all of this happened before you were how old? Before I was 30. Yes. Wow. Mm-hmm. Life has a way of just popping up there. Um, sometimes and (laughs) sometimes I almost feel like it's you're being led to a certain purpose in life and if you don't pay attention life's gonna just make certain things happen Mm -hmm. it's so unfortunate of course that that you had to suffer to the extent you had to suffer yeah it just uh, even starting with your brother I lost my husband to a brain tumor I know how that part feels I've lost both my parents you've lost your dad but then to throw a double whammy of grief, yeah. not only losing a good friend, but losing your own lifestyle mm-hmm. and having to deal with an unknown future for a period of time is incredible. Yet here we sit, the three of us in this little conversation, and Addison, you are so eloquent. Mm-hmm. Yeah, It came across in your book, and it certainly comes across in your speaking. You've probably answered about four of my questions before I've ever <laughs> had a chance to ask them, which is delightful. It really is, because that, that whole thing was just wrapped up in a nice little package about what happened, how you got to where you are, and what's your purpose for writing the book. And maybe that's a little bit of a defense mechanism. I'm sure you guys have that where... If I kind of put it all yes. together, wrap it and give it away and unwrap it for you really quickly, yep. maybe you won't get to the tender parts of, of you know, what this story really is. And I think exactly, right. exactly, exactly. So at any rate, as Stephanie says, wow, yeah. and kudos to you for getting to where you are today. Yeah. Yeah. Kudos. yeah. Now, your book, First Year of Grief Club, as I first looked at the cover I noticed immediately grief club. That's what I noticed first because those those were the larger letters. And that drew me immediately. And then I read first year of grief club. And what you have done is establish a connection with the reader so that you're touching base with them at intervals of time, that even your table of contents for a period of time is day one, day two, whatever. And then you go to weekly checks And it's an entire year of touching base with someone who's grieving. So can you just tell us for a little bit, why did you think of that format and why days here and weeks there? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for people around me, the book coming out, they, I think, you know, a lot of people said you did that so fast. And I thought that was funny because I was like, well, I've been in the grief arena for 13 years. Like, it doesn't <laughs> right. go fast to me. And fast. It <laughs> is, as I talk about in, in the back of the book, like it, it was sort of like, you know, a child being born. It's just, it's not ready till it's ready and it's developing and it was there. But right. I, you know, and then literally I jokingly say my water broke and it, it was time. Like <laughs> and the, the whole thing started to come yeah. out. But I was very delicate about it because I didn't want from my place in the arena as a peer to tell anyone anything that, you know, I wanted to think, how can I, how can I go alongside somebody and be supportive, but allow them to really come to their own conclusions. And the only way for me to do that is to kind of make these unconditional offerings and sort of plant these seeds and and say, Hey, why don't we just try this this week as an experiment? 
if it works for you and it serves you, great. Build a tool around it from that awareness. You know, I'll celebrate with you and then we'll move on to the next week. But if it doesn't work for you, toss it, you know. And so what I'm doing is sort of just guiding you through and sort of being a friend to the process of you figuring out what tools in your life work for what, what really doesn't serve you. And also just a special place to return on a weekly basis to, you know, connect again with your grief, because there is this thing about sort of two day bereavement leave, and then maybe, you know, a funeral, and then everyone gathers. And then it's just this, as I talk about this silence that you sit in, and, yeah. then, and then that's when it really starts. So before I had the book, which I wanted to be sort of the alternative to flowers and casseroles and condolences, you know, something you could give to somebody that outside of that initial surge of support, which hopefully they're getting, even if the pandemic's affecting them, right. that they would have for a year and I could stay with them for a year. So that was my my hope and my intention with the way that I designed it. And and I just I just wanted to still be there when that loneliness hits. And it doesn't have to be also like the first literal year. It can also be the first year that you're choosing to honor and experiment. You know, when you get to the point that I did where you're not going to try to fix this anymore and you're going to honor that, you know, grief mm -hmm. it starts the day it starts and it ends never. And I'm sorry to be the guy that tell you that my Canadian accent from mm -hmm. my family's coming back. I said, sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. sorry to tell you that, but you know, I, 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 I'm okay with being that guy and then being a friend on the way forward. Obviously, I, I'm in the midst of writing my memoir, which, you know, puts me as very much the lead character and everything you heard about my story. But in writing the sure. book, it allows me to be sort of the sidekick, the friend, the willing guy that goes along, you know, mm -hmm. the Ron Weasley to the Harry, you know, like letting the person who's actually yep. in that front seat of grief be in that front seat without my story being too much involved and over overpowering it. Thanks for sharing, Addison. Your book is, as I would describe it, interactive. But more than that, what I really love about it is if I think how I, and probably most people, normally read a book, you read it, you pick it up, you read it, set it aside, read it, set it aside, read it, set it aside. And over, you know, course of a period, maybe a day, maybe a week, you finish the book, you put it back on the shelf, and you're done. What's really nice about your book is that people can read it in little segments. Your little divisions of day. So at first you're kind of touching base with them, if you will, through your words every day. And then you give them time to write down how they're feeling emotionally, which I think is so important. We talk about journaling. This is a way, a form of journaling in a lot of ways, but it's very helpful to them and also provides them with something that as they go through their grief journey, maybe six months later or a year later, they can always look back and reflect on where they were and where they are now. And hopefully that will give them some emotional support as well. So I do like that interactive piece of it and the fact that people can use your book for an entire year mm -hmm. of touching base. Um, so thank you for that. Yeah, absolutely. And uh I did, um, with the journaling part, I did want to include something, but that also didn't feel permanent. That's why right. I played with the gray space and this idea of gray space and anything you write in the gray space can be a living, breathing thing. You know, it's not that you're defining your grief or your experience and forever anything you put in those gray spaces will be as you said it was on that day. It is something that I encourage people to like go back and scratch out or honor that that was the original thought and build off of it. But to really, you know, put in another sort of Trojan horse of approaching grief with this idea of just honoring a process and not looking for these results and these hard definitions right. of what is and what right. isn't. The other thing I want to point out to readers, and, it, you know, it may be obvious to some and not obvious to others, but if you look at a list of books about grief, a list of books that are intend to support you, you will find that the majority of them are written by women. I applaud you for writing this book and hope that perhaps some people who would rather hear the men's point of view also now feel a little more supported, which brings up this whole gray area, I think, my personal opinion, that men grieve differently than women. Do you feel that that's true? 
I think so. I, I spent a lot of time um, working in men's mental health, mm-hmm. you know, in the tech space and in a startup. And so I did get the opportunity to really spend thousands of hours listening to men talk, finding out, you know, how they operate and how they're most likely to engage when it comes to mental health. And I think obviously our grief processes and our mental health are, are you know, hand in hand. So I think it's very similar. And one of the things that we always found was that women heal eye to eye and men tend to heal shoulder to shoulder. And one thing that always seemed to be true is that men seem to learn and engage through experience, Mm -hmm. experientially learning. So it's sort of that mechanic metaphor of like, they want to know another man has gone through it, has tried it, that they can trust the process. And someone on the ground level, you know, that other peer, like I'm talking about, men really are responsive to that. Um, rather than maybe sitting with a mental health professional right away, you know, they warm up to all those things by knowing other men also experience what they're going through and try to figure out what worked for them and then, you know, experiment with that themselves. So I think it's very true what you're saying the way, you know, it's true from the statistics. I mean, just from the suicide and the mental health statistics that obviously men are not dealing with mental health in the same way as women are. And um, without generalizing too much, of course, you know, I I did sort of write it from that perspective in the sense of we are going to take that peer approach. We're going to experiment. We're going to find what works for us and what doesn't. You know, my idea of of the toolkit is every tool that you're going to use is going to look different for you based on how these experiments run. And I use this example a lot. But, you know, if your goal is to get a nail into a wall, there's many ways to do that. You know, and it t- it can take time before you realize that a, a beautifully crafted hammer that's meant to take the reverberations and has a grip and yeah. does that job. You know, there's a lot of other things you could try, like a brick or a shoe yeah. or <laughs> your hand, you know, yeah. and you learn lessons, right? You learn lessons. So, you know, and eventually you're you're seeing hopefully other men in the space show up more and more. Hopefully this is an invitation, not because I because I think I am one of the only men. I mean, obviously, other than the guy, David Kessler. <laughs> the like, guy, yes. You know, it's like, the guy, you know. So, you know, th- there isn't many in the space. And um, and so I hope this this act sort of as, you know, that anything I did in the mental health movement was, was this invitation to kind of, you know, I'm here, I'm showing up in the space and I'm doing it. And I hope that makes you feel a little bit safer and a little bit more comfortable right. to, to play in this as well and, and just get to know yourself again in grief yeah you know and be gentle in that way yeah now that you've brought up his name i have to say and i have to tell our listeners that for me personally again an opinion david kessler's books are informative they're educational but you write with that shoulder to shoulder Mm. that you mentioned Mm. and now that i've said that can you clarify for our readers a little bit more specifically what you mean by shoulder to shoulder, eye to eye? Yeah, absolutely. So, well, I think shoulder to shoulder, eye to eye, when that's, when that's used in reference to, you know, women's and men's mental health, which again, these are generalizations. And I, of course, you know, acknowledge that before the purposes right. of this conversation, where that comes from, you know, women are, are likely to engage eye to eye, speak about their feelings. You know, there's, there's a social connection around that practice. Okay. And it, it's there in our culture. Men, you know, healing shoulder to shoulder, maybe they're not looking in the eyes and going deep in that way. But by being together and by experiencing as a group, they are able to heal. And if one of the men who are shoulder to shoulder is willing to step into, you know, the safe space, share, grapple, learn, you know, whatever in a visible way, we did see again and again, time after time, and the, there's research to back this, that other men then engage and want to learn experientially too. So, and then for me personally, shoulder to shoulder is also what I was saying earlier, where, you know, I'm a peer, I'm in the grief arena, I'm not sitting in the bleachers studying this for years on end, um, which we need people doing like Kubler-Ross and Kessler, of course, but that's just an entirely different perspective. And, and I, there are amazing books out there and it's, it's never to measure one against the other because one of the weekly experiments is measuring doesn't serve you. (laughs) Um, But just to know where you're at, like I wanted to create something that you could get on the first day that was digestible and manageable and allowed you to sort of process. I, one of my favorite books ever is of course, it's okay to not be okay by Megan to be like, you know, she's done such a great job, 
But to be honest, to read that book, like I have to be much further in because otherwise someone's sort of yes. just telling me yes. what's going to happen. And it's kind of frightening, yeah. Yeah. you know, and same with David Kester. If you're looking at, you can't be, you're not looking at purpose and meaning in week right. two, No, you know, you're, you're just yeah. not there. So, you know, I, I loved that I had those books and I loved that I had those experts to go to. And I think Megan's kind of like a cool hybrid mm -hmm. of sort of expert and, and, you know, lived experience. So I really appreciated that. However, I, I did feel like there was something missing, especially from the male perspective on day one. And it just, again, this weird thing where I'm like, why are we spending so much money on flowers that will die that then exactly. they also have to throw out or bury in a week when we could have this, you know, beautiful book that can stay with them exactly. for a year but really, I mean, you could hand this thing to someone the moment you find out this is something you could have a few of in your closet like you do with birthday yeah, cards or exactly. whatever. And just, you know, here it is right now. Or, you know, thank God with Amazon, it can right. be there in <laughs> exactly. you know, 24 hours anyways. And it's just this nice surprise that shows up and when you're ready for it. And that's why I wanted to make it also visually appealing so yes. that it could find a home in people's in people's houses. And, yes. you know, I wrote this thing actually on Instagram the other day saying like, Yes, the book is white and yes, it was designed to be beautiful, but I also hope that it gets really dirty. I hope it gets smudged with fingertips Dog and sun-faded. Dog-eared and dirty, and, yep. you know, there, yeah. Yeah, exactly. There's yeah. life all over it because yeah. it's really meant to be a companion for exactly. real life right. grief. Exactly. You know, not this idea of this movie grief or, you know, right. not, not every grief process ends in this like amazing Aaron Brockovich yeah. moment <laughs> of overcoming something. Exactly. You know? That's not always how it goes. You exactly. Know? So, it's it's meant for real honoring, which means it's going to get dirty. It's going to be trial and error. And as long as you're committed to staying curious, kind, and compassionate to yourself, mm -hmm. mostly, and of course to others, I think that can be a, a good little friend to have for, for that year. I, I agree completely. And now that, you know, we've kind of talked about the men's perspective versus the women's and shoulder to shoulder versus eye to eye, I have to add that having read your book, you talked to me like my best friend. There was no man talking to woman. There was no male perspective. The words were You mean there's no mansplaining? <laughs> I did not see any. So if you if you look go back at me, to the page, go. you you send me the page number because I did not find any mansplaining. Thank you very much. I want that I want that in quotes in the second edition <laughs> okay. from you. you as, me, as the... I'll go on Amazon Amazon and write a review. He doesn't mansplain. <laughs> there, are, there is no mansplaining yes, in this book. Yes. Okay. All right. Please you look do. for it on Amazon because I'll write it. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, all in all, your book has a nice percentage of informing and awareness and as much or more support and deals with it in such a nice timing set, I guess, this whole day, 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 because certainly at the beginning of our grief journey, we need that daily support. Right. And, and mm -hmm. speaking of that, on your website, which um, I hope you'll mention later, you have a, a link to join the grief club community. And mm -hmm. I did mm -hmm. that, and I have to tell you, I was delighted, beyond delighted, one evening when a text message came to me from the grief club, just kind mm. of telling me, you know, hope your day was okay. I can't remember verbatim, but it was such a nice thing to get this random, unexpected text letting me know that somebody cared about how I was doing at that moment. So thank mm -hmm. you for that. And I hope you tell our listeners how to do that. I liked the fact that it's not, you know, every day you get this message <laughs> because after all, you forget those. Right. But I like that it was. Yeah. It was you you almost don't open them. <laughs> exactly. You stop paying attention to them. But this was random and so welcome in the evening. So thank so you. I, I appreciate that because you never really know. I, from my experience, you know, I, you know, I get a little paralyzed in how to show up fully. Yeah. And so what I just kept going back to is this idea, both in how the book is structured, and then with, you know, the grief club community, right. which we can put in the show notes, how to text that and get sure. involved. But if, if there was truly, you know, your version of Addison, your friend who, mm -hmm. who gets it, who, de who also knows that he doesn't get what you're going through at all, because he gets it, you know, mm -hmm. if it was like that, how would that be? And when something comes up, you know, you just be talking for five minutes at a time on exactly. those first during that first week. And then maybe once a week you have that check in. And then also exactly what you're saying. It's not structured. And actually the grief yeah. club texts 
you can't figure out the pattern on purpose so it does feel like that friend yeah. Yeah. checking in yeah. on you you know Genius. it's like there's there's perfectionists out there that are like oh i didn't get it this monday and whoever told you who made that rule yeah who, who that promised that, that you would check in <laughs> you know it's like it's not formal and exactly. life's not formal exactly. and in a way that that you know helps us to not expect certain types yeah. of support at exact moments because we're all brushing up against each other living right. lives in the midst of grief and sometimes which i'm sure you two can share you know you're in this in the same grief process and i'm using air quotes as other people who are very close right. to you yeah. but they're so different yeah you know right. and there's so much there so so it's it's nice to have that sort of friend who gets it that because you don't actually know me it can you choose when you right, use it right. and when you don't and how private or public exactly. it is or what you yeah. want to share or what you yeah. don't and you can just be experimenting and going oh without teaching anyone else anything or having to relay what you're learning you can be experimenting mm -hmm. and going oh okay mm -hmm. okay i'm going to use that because this week was just you know easier for me when right. i wasn't comparing mm -hmm. or right. you know when i wasn't consuming netflix shows about death <laughs> exactly never ending cycle you know you just <laughs> you learn these little things you know and then just keep going back to asking that question well what really serves me exactly you know does it serve me you know and and that's, I think that's the game changer when you just, right. for yourself, ask yourself that question truly. It's very hard mm -hmm. in a quiet, honest moment after a deep breath to lie in response right. to that question mm -hmm. for yourself. Right. Is this really serving me? Yeah. You know, exactly. and do I want to keep it or do I want to let it go? It, you know? Yep. Definitely. And we've talked about in the past about certain books when we were talking about the David Kessler and Megan's book and everything. Yeah. How those are very informational and and those are great to have and read. But like you said, your day one, even week three, you're just not going to sit down and read that in depth type of book. And I think this is such a great idea where you can just pick it up, read a little bit soak it in, think about it, things like that, and put it down mm -hmm. and go back. But I love that it spans like a good mm -hmm. year because that's, I've always said, instead of giving the flowers or the dishes or whatever, I'm more that person where I'm going to, three months later, I'm going to text you and just say, hey, how you doing? Because that's when people tend to forget about it. You know, they remember right, right in the beginning, mm -hmm. they do the calling hours, the funeral, a couple weeks later, they'll check on you. But the three, six months later, um, so having your book is kind of a friend for someone a year down the road, even. I think I love that concept. Yep. Mm -hmm. and, and for anyone listening who's listening from the perspective of supporting, I always like to say, like my number one go to if you're supporting someone is just to ask, what does support look like for you right now? Mm -hmm. Empower them to be the expert of their experience and, and let you know what, what support would look like for in the moment. And yeah, like you said, in my, my book team's going to be like, wait, what are you saying? No, they should send them the book right away. <laughs> yes, please. If you feel compelled, sell them the book. But also, see, I, I suck because I'm just I'm stuck at sales because I'm just like a human. But I think, you know, if, if you feel compelled to, you know, because obviously food can be so comforting. And, you know, if, if flowers traditionally, you know, it, flowers for me just became a, a, a scent trigger that I had spent 10 years untriggering. Mm -hmm. Every time I smelled flowers, I felt like I was in a funeral home. Exactly. Um, but, but if that is important to you, I, you know, that idea of, okay, look at the calendar date and schedule on Google Calendar or wherever you schedule three months from yeah. now to send that dish or that flowers, three, six, nine, right. 12, right. when, when everybody has sort of retreated and they feel this expectation to just return to normal life when mm -hmm. they're going to be honoring this journey every day for the rest of their life. Exactly. So I, I do love, you can still do that. They can send the book and then, you know, book team. Yes, you can send the book. <laughs> Um, but then also schedule, you know, yeah. And it, it, we live in a world where definitely like, don't feel weird about that. Schedule it. Yeah. yeah like I would, yeah. I would forget, like, yeah. you know, it's like, I'd forget right. for me. So, you know, like that, it is something that, you know, you can put in and have Google or Siri or Alexa or whoever you talk yep. to uh, remind you, you know, three months from now, you know, that's when all the other lasagnas right. will be there. That's when all the other casseroles yeah. will be gone. The flowers will definitely yeah. be dead. <laughs> yes. Uh, you know, so it's yes. like, yes. that's the moment where I would, that sort of re-entry and check-in. And, you know, I think we get afraid a little bit to sort of re-trigger people. But, you know, having support in a lifelong journey with grief is never triggering. Right. 
I, exactly. I, I've never once been like, oh, I wish you didn't bring right. that up today and yeah. support right. me. I haven't you thought know, of it in a, a while. I've ever had. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, no, it's like every morning I wake up and I'm like, yeah, bud, those right. things happen. Yeah. Um, yeah. So how would you like to navigate today? Right. That's yeah. pretty much a daily yeah. thing yeah. for me and exactly. honoring that. Yeah. Okay. Well, sadly, Addison, our time is winding down. So before we wrap up for today, we want to offer you a chance to speak directly to our listeners. You know, I've mentioned your community forum. We've talked about your book. And I know also that you are an advocate for mental health, especially for men. So this is your opportunity to speak directly to our listeners without us guiding the topic and just tell them whatever you would like them to know about the services you offer, the support you can provide. Absolutely. So first, I'd just like to say thank you um, to everyone who's listening. Uh, And if you do find yourself in Grief Club, that you are certainly not alone, no matter how inherently individual or lonely a grief process can feel. Um, Of course, as we spoke about at length, my gift back to the grief community has been putting together this book, First Year of Grief Club, A Gift from a Friend Who Gets It. And that's available on Amazon worldwide. So it is something you can get for yourself or gift to somebody, as we were talking about today, at that moment where they where they will need it, you know, immediately and most. As Kathy so lovingly helped me plug, um, I also created a free text message service for Grief Club. And I we can put the phone number in the in the notes for this yes. episode. And because my grief brain used to remember every number ever, but it does not remember it <laughs> now. Too. And I honor that. <laughs> and I say thank you for podcast notes. But um so that's also an option there. And the only other thing that I would say is you can find me Addison Brazil, Brazil like the country with an S, um, on on social media and um mygriefclub.com is the website. And this book, especially in my journey as a peer, is meant to be a living, breathing thing that I learn from. I intend for there to be other editions of this book with other people's lived experiencing, influencing how it grows and changes and shifts over the years. So I would love, you can email me, share at mygriefclub.com as you're reading the book, as you're going through it. There's prompts, as Kathy will tell you throughout the book even, to to do that because I want to know what music, you know, helps you remember them. I want to know how these experiments and, and how life is going with these sort of grief experiments and offerings. So I am an open door in that way. And um, I look forward to connecting with anybody who um, feels compelled to. Thank you so much. As always, listeners, information on how to contact Addison, his website information, and anything else we can give you as a resource will be available in the podcast notes, the episode notes. The podcast will be available, as all of them are. We hope you share it. And lastly, talking about the book, I know we spent a lot of time talking about the book, but I just have to say, this book particularly makes a great gift Mm -hmm. because you are letting someone know that not only do you support them by offering them something that will help you hope will help them, but you're also introducing them to a new friend. Mm -hmm. And it's a friend who is going to be there with them for the entire first year. And hey, we all know that when you finish a really, really good book, you go back to the beginning and start over again. And we'll never stop growing in our grief journey because, my opinion again, I'm going to be grieving for the rest of my life. So thanks for joining us today. Addison, thank you again so much. We look forward to hearing about your memoir when it's released. And maybe you'll come back again and uh, talk to us about your memoir because I know that also will provide a lot of support for people who are grieving. So listeners. Be well, take care of yourselves. Self-care is very important. And we'll talk to you next time as we all continue to live in grief. Thank you so much for listening with us today. Do you have a topic that you'd like us to cover or do you have a question from one of our episodes? Please email us at info at asiliveandgrieve.com and let us know. We hope you will find a moment to leave a review, send an email, and share with others. Join us next time as we continue to live and grieve together.